previously on Flowers for Zoe, Stories for Dennis. Got my first batch of three trenton and I did that. And all this time, I'm kind of know I'm going downwards, but I'm, in the back of my head, I'm trying to get better. And now coming up on the show. How do you yeah. find that window where he's coherent enough to have a conversation? How is a conversation supposed to start when I'm so frustrated? It's not the window. <laughs> there, there's no window there. <laughs> On today's podcast, we do some healing, as we talk about Dennis more than a year after his death from fentanyl. If you find anything on today's episode activating, please reach out and talk to somebody. If you find the discussion helpful, please share the link with others. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Hi. So we're here. We're all together again. It's been, I think, a couple of weeks since we've been all together podcasting. I had a nice weekend over Ukrainian Christmas. I went up to see my brother at his gravesite. And it was the first time I said to him, and, and I just blurted it out. And it kind of took me by surprise. But I said, hey, bro, I'm really sorry I didn't save you. You know, we've all been talking about healing recently, and that was a real healing moment for me. The healing process, God, it doesn't happen overnight. We're here like just over a year later. Not that I measure myself and say, I think this is where I am. I think this is where I am. I don't really do that. But sometimes these feelings just pop up out of nowhere. So it's, it's almost like you never know when you're going to finish dealing with it. And that's why I like visiting his grave so much. It puts me right beside him and in a perfect frame of mind to think about him and to think about what happened to him. He's, a, he's been on my mind a lot. And it gets me thinking a little bit about there's the seasons, right? Like there were, we just went through the whole holiday season. And, and I think the seasons, I don't know, they bring up different feelings about it and different memories and it's even just going through the holidays without him here and even though we've done this was the second Christmas the first Christmas was just weeks after he passed away and I think we were all just numb yeah we were still in shock and this Christmas was different I was really missing him you know I lived far away from him And we weren't all that connected. And I think lately and directly because of the podcast and how much time we spend together and how much talking and communicating we've done about him and working together as a family and supporting you, Zoe, and you bringing in so much insight for us all to think about. And like so much has changed. I guess that's what I'm saying is so much has changed. And now I really want him here want him here to you know to be involved with all of this I think about where would he be right now what would he be doing what would have been different for him right like so much has changed for us now what would have been different for him how would it be I think he would be sitting right here right now (laughs) do you think he'd be involved with the podcast do you think he would like it I think he'd be off camera he'd be kind of stubborn about it Once he got into it, I think he would have a lot to say. And I think he would feel exactly how you feel right now, Zoe. You feel like, holy shit, I did it. And you know what? I'm looking at what I did, and I need need to share that. I need to share that. I need to help someone. And I think he would be in that role just like you are. I love hearing that because that's what I I want to think. But I'm also just reminded there's been a process that's happened here that he wasn't part of. The process started when he passed away. And when I think back to what it was like at that time, it was chaos. His insight was low because he was so unwell and he was struggling and he was in the low. He was in the the low of the dip. If he had the opportunity to come out of it, I think he would have come out of it like he had done before. But 
those last few months, they weren't great. Like he was really struggling. And if I think about how different it is now, like listen to us here talking in this way, we couldn't do this then. No. Right. We like he was struggling. And this is where, you know, this this topic of like <clears throat> how families process through healing. You know, when I think about where we are today and where we were then, I mean, it's just it's it's really different. I remember. And Zoe, well, you weren't there, but it was your dad and Daniel and I did a Zoom and it was close to Dennis's birthday. And we just had a visit. Do you remember? And the three of us. What, yeah. the, right before his birth, like the yeah. his 50th birthday, right before yeah. that birthday? Yeah, it was right before that birthday. And we had a Zoom visit and we chatted and we didn't, you know, and there we, there was lots of attempts to have conversations with him. And it it all sounded the same. It sounded like that stuff that, we know now doesn't really work which is like you got to go to treatment you got to hand over your money you gotta you know it was this list of things that we were telling him he had to do but on this particular day and it was right before his birthday we kind of let go of it and we just had a visit and I remember we talked about Netflix shows and we talked about music and we talked about him turning 50 and we talked about you know it was just it was just regular family connection. I'm so glad we had that. Sounds like it was nice. Yeah, I remember that too. And it was nice. And you're right. You're so right. We were doing all the things that didn't work. I feel like if, you know, if that conversation started off like any of those other conversations, it would have been closed off you guys wouldn't have had the opportunity or the chance to talk about everything that you did. It was because that subject was just dropped and you guys were able to have a normal conversation that didn't revolve around what was going wrong or what was actually happening. It was just regular (laughs) brothers and sister talking. That's it. And that must have been so so nice because he probably wasn't even thinking about the other shit it was probably such a weight off of his shoulders he was probably expecting something completely different than what he got as good as it was for you I bet you it was it was really good for him are you sure I didn't lecture him on that call it might have started there but it really quickly shifted Because I remember at the end of the phone, at the end of the Zoom, we said, oh, we should do this again. This was really nice. He he was talking about the kids. He was talking about you, Zoe. He was talking about Carrie. He was just talking about things that he wanted in his life. And we were talking about our favorite shows. I think you're so right, Zoe, because, you know, what we lost in that moment was that dynamic of power. You know, and I think this is the trap for most families. You know, there's this the dynamic of powerlessness. Like he felt really powerless in the addiction. It was swallowing him up and he didn't want it. He hated it. And he didn't like that it dictated his life. And he didn't like the optics of how he appeared. And we were all trying to show him, hey, you look terrible and you're not coping. And, you know, we were coming in pretty heavy in trying to get him to stop using And I think we were also powerless in it. We were powerless too. We were coming across like we, you know, we were trying to like get him to see it our way and do what we wanted, but we knew that we couldn't stop him. We knew that we couldn't change him. And so the more we became fearful, we became more directive and we became more threatening, even though we didn't want to be. Like you said, speaking out of fear rather than love. And the love was there. But fear can be overbearing. Fear can be overpowering. It's not a bigger emotion than love, but it can come off very, very strong. When you're scared, a lot of things are said in a way that we don't intend them to sound. 
And you get all that, Zoe? Like you can empathize with your dad and how he felt. Oh, being sure. lectured and being told and being given of course goals anybody, of what to do. Yeah, anybody in uh, like in that hot seat, they're gonna avoid conversation. They're going to like you know seclude themselves away from people because of that, right? Like you know what you have to do, and I've said it a lot before. You, you know, we know what we have to do. We don't need to be told. We just need help getting there. You know more than anybody what to do. Of course. Of course. It makes so much sense now. Yeah. So that's, you know, bringing back that conversation, like he probably avoided having those sit downs with you guys because he was avoiding those conversations coming up. Not that he wanted to not talk and sit down and be involved with these Zoom meetings and whatever else. He was avoiding that topic entirely. You seclude yourself from from loved ones, from family, from close friends. And it's true. It was hard to get him to talk. Yeah. First of all, he might have been using, he might have been withdrawing, and that takes up a lot of your day. Mm Mm-hmm. But then when when the opportunity was there where he was in a position to talk, he wouldn't want to talk about it. But at that time, too, then you're using and then it's like, why would I want to talk about this? I'm not sick. I'm not in a position to, you know, reach out for help if I feel fine. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, when you're using, you feel fine. So you're like, I'm fine. (laughs) I don't need any help. I'm I'm okay. But it's not until you're sick where you're like, holy shit, I'm fucked. Like, I need help. Like, what do I do? And then you don't feel like talking because you're sick, you know? But then when you're using, you don't feel like talking because you feel fine and you're using. So when is there time to talk about it? So let's add in the layer of loved ones and caregivers. I think about, okay, well, what did it actually look like? So here's what it looks like. He's so out of it that he's fallen down and he's crashed. He's so out of it that he's stooped over and he's bent over. And he's like, he's in this, you know, stupor where he, we can't even, you can't even believe that he's balancing and he's standing. This is, I think, layered with everything that you just said. I think this is what makes it hard for families. Like, how do you find that window to yeah. talk to him how do you yeah. find that window where he's coherent enough to have a conversation when your window might be an hour or two a day or maybe days go by where it's not even possible then there's another level of exhaustion and discouragement that sets in i and think for families oh yeah and frustration not to mention you know how do you maintain safety in a house how do you maintain safety for other people I think this is what makes this such a challenging conversation. Looking back at that time, it's so easy to say, oh, I could have done this, could have done that. But during that whole time, I was so frustrated. I was at my wit's end. I was so frustrated some days. And again, how is a conversation supposed to start when I'm so frustrated? It's not the window. <laughs> there, there's no window there when it's in that, right? This is the tragedy in it. You know, because it's nobody's fault. He wasn't doing anything wrong. And you weren't wrong for feeling that way. Yeah. Yeah, for feeling frustrated, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and especially because... Even though it was, it wasn't a life and death situation. I never said to myself, I got to talk to him tonight or tomorrow. He might not be here. It went on for so long that you're right. You know, like he's been using, he was using for how long? And he was okay. I mean, he wasn't, but he was, you know, like it wasn't his last day, you know, like we, and we knew that. Never in my life did I think that his passing would have to do with drugs as much as he he was an addict and stuff. He just I never thought that it would be the reason to end his life. He was 
smarter than that. He knew just he just wasn't the regular person that used drugs. He just wasn't to me. You know, like I don't know how he knew he knew his stuff. He knew safety. He had an extremely high tolerance to the drug. And that's why I honestly believe if if this could happen to my dad, it can happen to anyone. What does healing look like? The podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's one of the things that's helping. I think it's been a huge part of my healing. Yeah, it's it has helped me so much. What's helped you so much? This podcast. Being able to talk about my dad and not like be crippled by it. You know, he didn't die in vain in my eyes. You know, I'm helping the next person, my fellow addicts out there. <laughs> I'm able to get the word out and, and explain what I know about it and hopefully save somebody else's life or, or help somebody on their recovery journey. That's the hard part because it always seems to be that the people that need the most help are the people that don't ask for it. How's our family doing? How are we doing? Do you think we're talking differently about addiction? Do you think we're understanding it differently? I think it's the conversations that we've been having that saved us. Our family could have been broken apart from this. (laughs) 